Alfonso Cuaron versus Alejandro Gonzalez in Yaritu. Mm. This has been a versus uh, video comparison suggested by many, many of you, and I can definitely see why, but to get to the core of who I believe is the greater filmmaker with the superior catalog of films, we're going to have to get a bit personal. Back in 2011 or 2012, I ran a blog and wrote about movies for a couple websites, but I ran this blog that was primarily dedicated to Spanish and Mexican cinema. So primarily dedicated to the classic masters like Pedro Almodovar and Victor Arice, who made uh, The Spirit of the Beehive, that sort of thing. It was also primarily focused on the new Mexican filmmakers like Alfonso Cuaron, Alejandro González Iñárritu, and Guillermo del Toro, just to name a few. In fact, most of my work in film criticism for at least a few years was uh, absolutely dedicated to exploring the films of these new Mexican um, directors because I thought that they were very, very, very important, significant telling, like, like premonitions of what to come, because I thought that we were in the scope of a Mexican new wave. I thought we were in the scope of this new Mexican becoming when uh, dealing with film, and arguably I was absolutely right. They, uh, this past decade, they have definitely <laughs> mastered uh, and became kings of, of popular cinema, most certainly. But I was able to do a couple really cool things when I was working on this blog, and I was able to interview a lot of people who were directly involved with these films. For instance, I interviewed Vanessa Bosch, who played Susanna in Amores Peros, which was awesome, and I was able to have an incredible experience where I interviewed Maribel Verdu, who played um, Luisa, oh, bless my heart, in Ituma Matambian, Cuaron's film, and uh, also Mercedes in Pan's Labyrinth. Interviewing Maribel Verdu was, was an incredible experience, and she spoke glowingly of Alfonso, saying that he demanded honesty and truth, actually absolute honesty and truth from his actors while directing that movie. And when I first discovered Ituma Matambian, I, it came to me at a time where I needed it most, because most films that focused on teenagers were incredibly insincere. And I needed one that didn't feel like it was lying to me, and Ituma Matambian did not know how to lie to me. It was full of absolute truth and honesty. It was gripping, it was real, it didn't lie to me, and it taught me very valuable things that I needed to know at that specific age. Now, Maribel Verdu exposed that my reading of the film was actually rather limited, that it's not a coming-of-age story, it's actually the opposite. It's about coming to terms with death with dignity. It's about dying with absolute dignity, honesty, and integrity that it's really about a woman experiencing everything life has to offer her in her final moments without ever being obscene. In fact, the obscenities and the barbarities have to be viewed in their most naive forms. And that's what Diego Luna and Gael Garcia Bernal, the teenagers, are for. That's what their use is in the film. They are vessels. They are filters. They are purifiers. They take what can be seen as graphically obscene, and they make it purely and sweetly naive. And that's truly what Itumama Tambien is actually about. And I had no idea of that until I spoke with Maribel Verdu, and that was a kind of like a mind-blowing thing. And it was awesome that Luisa herself had to explain to me, no, you see, this is what it's actually about. <laughs> and that was like a kind of out-of-body experience. Hmm. Itumama Tambien means a lot to me. But let me tell you another story, another little anecdote, about sitting in an empty movie theater when I was 16 years old or 17, something like that, and watching Babel <laughs> by myself. Watching Gael Garcia Bernal again reappear before me in a different film, wringing a chicken's neck in the, the largest screen I've ever seen. It was a mortifying experience. You see... Alejandro González Iñárritu, before Birdman, he made these incredibly hypersensitive, hyper-intense, hyper 
um, violent films about emotionality, about the human condition, about this shared human existence. Films that were very much in debt to Rossellini and neorealism. The, the, the film... The films were all textured by this neo-realism that uh, is certainly from Rossellini. Rossellini has to be a huge influence on early Inyaritu, but Inyaritu is actually a master because what Inyaritu is a master of are stylistic interruptions. He's a master of the here and the beyond, right? And that's what he does so effortlessly. In fact, I'm thinking of Beautiful. Beautiful is probably his best film. I think it's his best film, and I think it's the best film of the current decade. Most certainly um, in the top five. In the top five of the best films of the current decade is Beautiful. And forgive me, it is a beautiful film. So what he does are these stylistic interruptions. It works as neorealism. You have what appears to be natural lighting, natural sets, uh, occasionally real actors. At least they feel palpable, tactile, and visceral. Um, at least they feel like, like real people in these real situations. But what he does is it doesn't always have to be surrealism, although in Beautiful it kind of was. In Beautiful, Javier Bardem wonderfully portrays the lead. And every so often, he loses himself, and he imagines himself in a snowy, um, make-believe, nearly mythical, faraway, snowy uh, forest with the ghost of his father. Now, his father died as a young man, so Javier Bardem is older than his father in these illusions, in these fantasies, in these dark fantasies. And his father is making animal noises at him um, and speaking to him cryptically, but also naively uh, in a very contradictory way. Because it's not just naivety, it's an all-knowing naivety speaking to him. And these are stylistic interruptions. These directly interrupt the um, incredibly hyper-intense realism of the emotionality on screen. And, and by the way, these are soul-crushing films. These are films that dig right inside of your heart and yank it out of you. So these stylistic interruptions are warranted. They are welcomed. In fact, it helps Beautiful. It doesn't at all impede Beautiful's progress in tearing that heart out of your chest, what it does is it makes it so it's being lifted out rather than viciously torn out. What Inyaritu wants to do is move you, is massage you, is affect you. He does not want you to be able to leave one of his films unchanged. And for a long time, you didn't. Amores Peros came at a time where I really needed a film that was narratively rambunctious, that was narratively unpredictable. I needed something beyond Pulp Fiction, maybe even beyond Chungking Express. I needed something hyper-intense that was completely disfigured narratively. And that's what Amores Peros was, and that's that stylistic interruption once again, because Amores Peros is another heart-wrenching, incredibly emotionally confrontational film about culture, about love, about animal abuse, about family, about dynasty, about dying, about living, about continuing, and ultimately about surviving. Amores Peros came at a time, uh, I discovered it at least, at a time where I truly needed that movie. I needed to be moved off of my seat. I needed to be moved to tears by a film that was narratively majestic, in which that film definitely was. It breaks the neorealism by jumping back and forth within this non-linear structure that uh, makes even Tarantino seem normal when we're speaking about a, a narrative context. And Yaratu has always had this ability to deeply affect me. Beautiful is a deeply, deeply affecting film. Um, those scenes between Javier Bardem and the ghost of his father are some of the most haunting scenes I've ever seen, and they continue to haunt me to this day and mesmerize me still. I still think of them as very therapeutic scenes within this absolute chaos of, of, of emotion, within this absolute torment of dread and depression. These therapeutic scenes that are still dark, 
that are still kind of, like I said, haunted. But maybe that's the point. Maybe that's the absolute point of pathos. That is absolute pathos and absolute sincerity through a stylistic lens. Hell, even when we get to Birdman, which is about artificiality, but he gets just as superficial when dealing with the artificial as he got uh, relentless when dealing with reckless abandon through emotionality in his earlier films. Birdman is an incredibly put-together movie, and it wears its stitches happily. And it's an endearing kind of thing because it's obviously lampooning art, films, and celebrity, and the process of creation, directing, acting, all of that. So the stitching, which is directly in front of your face, the way that these long shots end, or how they're like magically put together, is endearing. Unlike something like Children of Men by Quaron. I used to love Children of Men. I used to be really um, amazed by the technical tricks in the film, until it dawned on me that the only thing the film has is trickery. There is no honesty. It's actually a rather insincere film. It relies on trickery so heavily for no true reason. It does not propel emotion. It does not propel truth. It does not propel sincerity. It is a very, very facile type of movie. Same with Gravity. Gravity does not have that absolute truth and honesty that Maribel Verdu told me was once so important to the director. Even Roma feels bloated, much like Gravity did. Roma feels like an incredibly bloated film, even though it's obviously not. It's obviously a smaller picture, but it's incredibly overcomposed and overdirected to the point of insincerity. Now, there's one thing I will say about Inyaritu. I'm, I'm, well, I guess I've said many a great thing about Inyaritu. He is not insincere. He is not insincere. He is a very truthful director. You see, Alejandro Gonzalez Inyaritu is a master of human emotion, the human condition on film, and a master of stylistic interruptions, while Alfonso Cuaron is a master of none. It is Inyaritu who takes this win. No question. Ituama Tambien means the world to me. I think it's a wonderful movie, but it's also the only movie Quaron made that I like. I don't care for his earlier films, I definitely do not care for Harry Potter 3, and I don't care for his wider catalog. But Ituama Tambien, it's a wonderful film. Alfonso Quaron is a good filmmaker who made one masterful film, but really, what more could you ask of a regular human being? Because that film is incredible and speaks to me so deeply still to this day. Whereas in Yaritu, his catalog is filled with films that have nearly changed my life, each and every one, but specifically Beautiful and Amores Peros really, really altered a lot of things about me. Uh, Amores Peros is part of the foundation on which my entire cinephilia, my entire love for film, it's one of the, one of the building blocks of that. The, the cathedral of my love for movies is built on, on top of movies like Amores Peros. I owe a lot to Inyaritu, but Inyaritu is a master. Everything about his films really is just so absolutely well realized. And he never fails in his, in his drive to completely demolish you and help you rebuild Right? And those stylistic interruptions, the, the very notion of a stylistic interruption has changed my outlook on humanity, on philosophy. Because no one is truly consistent emotionally or philosophically. No one is absolutely consistent. We have these stylistic interruptions, not only in the form of actual dreams, but in the form of serendipity, in the form of just human naivety. We have these stylistic interruptions within our own lives. We can be living in a chaos of depression, in a torment and whirlwind of sadness and despair. But there are these stylistic interruptions. Human beings will always seek truth, will always seek the cinematic. And to Inyaritu, the cinematic is holiness, because his characters are searching for meaning, are searching for ways to build themselves up out of nothing, are searching for ways to be reborn are searching for God. 
that's what Inyaritu's characters are doing. So, so these stylistic interruptions are not simply there as stylistic interruptions. Those are the moments of God. Those are the moments of divinity. Those are actually capturing cinematic moments in their most holy form and keeping them there for, for those short amount of times, for as, for as short a time as a stylistic interruption takes to baptize you in pure cinema. That's in Yaritu. That's in Yaritu. And Yaritu is an absolute master. And Yaritu is a name that we will remember forever. Quaron, I'm, I'm just really not a fan of his wider catalog. But I can tell you reasons why, because his wider catalog is insincere to the point of he needs to regroup and figure out who he was when he made Itamama Tamian. Both of these filmmakers are incredibly talented. And when I had that blog, I had this prediction as well. I said that the future belongs to the Mexican filmmakers. The future belongs to Mexican cinema. And judging by this last decade and who's won Academy Awards, it certainly does. And I was absolutely right. Mexican cinema, that's what this culture, that's what this age is certain decades belong to certain cultures, certain groups, certain nationalities. Certain decades definitely do. And this one and the one previous certainly belong to the Mexican filmmakers, to Inyaritu, to Del Toro, to Cuaron. It certainly belongs to these people. They have something, they have a way of viewing the world and capturing it on film that no one else necessarily possesses. This is their time. And these are incredible films. These are defining films of, uh, of generations, of my generation. These are the defining artistic masterpieces. These are the films that propel the medium forward in artistic, spiritual, emotional, and really just gratifying ways. These are incredibly important filmmakers. And Yaritu, I crown him the winner of this, but truly they both are. They both are pioneers of what I consider to be the new age of cinema. The age that we are currently living in, I think, is in their debt. I think that they are truly the pioneers and architects of where we are now, at least speaking artistically and not commercially. Where we are artistically is in debt to the uh, Mexican filmmakers who... Ma uh, made their bones in the 2000s and then <laughs> made their living in the 2010s and, and really uh, no one should ever forget who they are. Um, I, love, I love them to death. Uh, in yard too, yes, yes, yes. He, he's, he's changed my world several times and um, Quaron, he, he's, uh, he's really affected me once. So that one time, I mean, it's still nearly God in my book, you know? Uh, not meaning to say anything rude or crude about Quaron, it's just when you're up against an Yaritu, who to me uh, feels like a superhuman director. I don't know, I, I don't know what, I don't believe he's real. I don't believe he truly exists because each one of his films is masterful um, in their own way and uh, Maybe no modern filmmaker, uh, apart from Sofia Coppola, has moved me as deeply and as often as Alejandro Inyaritu has and continues to do. Um, I love Inyaritu. I even love Birdman. It's really cool to hate Birdman now, which doesn't feel right. It's even a return to form for Edward Norton. If you grew up in my generation, you grew up in awe of Edward Norton's acting abilities. And that was the first time I saw the old Edward Norton in, like, decades. And... You know what? Birdman's just great. Just get over that. Just get over that. Birdman's good. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching this video, even though it was full of incoherence. Um, I really think that we talked about some interesting things today. In the comments below, who would you choose? Quaron or Inyaritu? I obviously choose Inyaritu, and I hope I um, accurately articulated and expressed why I do. Um, I love Inyaritu. Thank you guys for watching this video. Like, comment, subscribe, share. Leave suggestions for future verses in the comments. And I will get to them eventually. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of free time, so it takes me quite a bit to actually get to some of these suggestions. Like, this one was suggested months ago. Months ago, but then it was re-suggested by several different people, so I thought, okay, fine, I have to do it. Even though, as I said, I ran this blog, and I'm kind of... If there's anything I'm tired of talking about, it's Mexican cinema, because I wrote so much about it already. 
but I really hope um I really hope you found value in this video and if you did give it a like thank you guys so much for watching uh, my name's been Zachary Conan and have a remarkable day